Hey everyone, Alistair here. So the other day, Dan came up to me and asked, Hey Alistair, if I wanted to find a planet outside of our solar system and determine if it met the right conditions to be habitable, how exactly would I go about doing that? To which I replied, Daniel my boy, put a brew on and pull up a beanbag and let me tell you all about it. There are actually several methods used to detect exoplanets orbiting distant stars, so we'll cover a few of the most used and significant ones. One of the earliest and most successful methods used is known as the radial velocity method. Essentially, this works under the principle that when a planet orbits a star, what is actually happening is both bodies are orbiting the center of mass of both the planet and the star. This causes the star to slowly wobble as the planet orbits around it. If we know the size of the star, which we can determine through measuring its apparent magnitude, or simply its brightness, and comparing that to its distance, which we can determine through methods such as parallax for example, we can then determine a lot of information about the planet that orbits it. The planet's mass can be determined by measuring the star's radial velocity, which we can then determine by measuring the variations of its velocity relative to Earth, or simply by how much it's wobbling. To find this out, we use a little thing called Doppler spectroscopy. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the Doppler effect. When something's moving towards you, say a car for example, the sound of its engine sounds higher pitched, and then, as it passes and moves away, it sounds lower pitched. That's because the sound waves are effectively being squashed as it's travelling towards you and stretched as it's travelling away, causing higher and lower frequency waveforms. While the same thing actually happens with light. Light we observe from stars makes up a spectrum, and in this spectrum of light there are several gaps known as absorption lines. These gaps are due to photons of certain frequencies being absorbed and re-emitted in random directions by the surface level elements of a star. The position and distance between these gaps correspond to specific elements such as the ones we expect to see in stars, such as hydrogen and helium. However, the spectrum of light we receive from stars has gaps that have been shifted. This is due to the star moving relative to us, and hence, the wavelength of the light we are observing has been stretched, and by measuring how much the spectrum has been shifted, we can actually determine the velocity of the star relative from us. For stars moving away from us, this phenomenon is known as redshift. So, by measuring the variation in the velocity of the star relative to Earth, we can then calculate the star's radial velocity, which we can then use to calculate the mass of the planet or planets that orbit it. Then it's just a simple matter of determining the planet's orbital radius from the period of the star's orbit by using Kepler's third law. This method was used in 1995 to discover the first planet in orbit of another star, and was the primary method of detecting exoplanets until around 2012, when the Kepler spacecraft overtook it by using the transit method. The transit method, or transit photometry, observes a visible star and detects the slight drop in brightness caused by a planet that crosses in front of the parent star's disk. The dimming is very slight, but from it we can determine the radius of the planet orbiting the star and then, used in conjunction with the mass we've calculated from the radial velocity method, we can then estimate the planet's density. The obvious disadvantage of using this method is that a planet's orbit has to be perfectly aligned relative to the observer's vantage point. However, by diligently observing a small fraction of space and constantly watching for those small dips in light from stars, the Kepler Observatory has managed to confirm over 2,300 exoplanets so far by using this method, far more than anything before it. But you're not here for just any old exoplanets. You want to know which ones are potentially habitable, either by us or maybe even by life similar to us. Well, there's a few conditions that need to be met for a potential candidate. Namely, the planet has to be relatively similar in both size and mass to Earth, both of which we've already determined from the aforementioned methods. And secondly, the planet has to orbit in what's known as the Goldilocks zone, which is just the right distance from a star, depending on its magnitude, for that all-important ingredient for life as we know it to exist in a liquid state, water. So far, we've managed to confirm a total of 30 exoplanets that are less than twice Earth's size that exist in their star's Goldilocks zone. These planets have all the right conditions to be potentially habitable so far. Right size, right temperature, but what else do we need for a truly habitable planet? Well, one thing I find we quite enjoy doing on Earth is breathing, and for that we need an atmosphere. Remember when I was talking about observing the spectral lines from light we observe from stars? Well, we can actually use the same method to observe light that passes through an atmosphere of a planet. And, depending on what elements absorb and re-emit photons, we can then determine from the spectral lines the chemical composition of that atmosphere. Unfortunately, as it stands, our current telescopes are simply too small to give any accurate information on this matter, and it won't be until the next generation before we can get any significant observations. However, this may be sooner than you think. As of now, we're in the process of building the EELT telescope, which will be the largest telescope ever constructed, with a dish diameter of 40 meters by the time it is completed in 2024. And before that even, the James Webb Space Telescope will be launched. Both of these telescopes will be sophisticated enough to study the atmosphere of some of these potentially habitable exoplanets. 
Incidentally, the James Webb Telescope will be placed in the Earth-Sun L2 Lagrange point, which, if you want to know more about, go check out our video on Lagrange points. <laughs> so there you have it. In recent years, we've made leaps and bounds in our search for planets similar to Earth, with even more great strides sitting just over the horizon. And who knows, maybe we'll even find that perfect planet within the coming years. This is Alistair, signing off. Thank you for watching Space Doc. Please remember to like, subscribe and share for more science fiction spacecraft summaries. If you enjoy the channel, why not consider pledging your support on Patreon? For just $1 a month, you'll be able to access the Space Doc schedule to see what's coming up.